So one of the remarkable things about this museum is that it's right in the city center. So in this, you know, completely urbanized space, we all, all of a sudden has something that is so different from the rest. And as a part of this labyrinthine garden that we, we uh, will have here, we have a light rail track running through it. Uh, with a lot of people daily will travel to the university or to the new super hospital uh, and, and they will come into this oasis, uh, green oasis that is where everything is curved, where there's not a 90 degree angle at all. Uh, that is kind of like whispering, get off. You don't need to live your life from A to B. You can be, there can be another way of traveling that is not about reaching your destination but it's about the adventure that is just around the corner. This is what this promises. This is that, that around these round uh, hedges, around the corner of East, there can be another experience. There can be a new experience. You can meet something for the first time. So, so, uh, so that has been part of the idea that, that the fairy tale of Anderson is to go on a journey where I don't know where you'll end up. Uh, it's about being in the here and now uh, and his world is also a world where opposites isn't is rarely really opposites. So we have created this uh, universe where, where the architecture is very organic, and the organic is very architectural. If you look at the hedges; they are kind of like very sculpted, and they almost at some points they merge together. Uh, the the hedges become facade elements, and it becomes their way of filtering the light. That, that becomes part of the indoor experience. So we blend what is outside, what is inside, what is nature, what is architecture. And instead of it being an architectural experience where you can stay in from one place and see it all, this is about you need to travel through it. It's like a sequence of experiences. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, Kengo Kumar, the architect, says that he wants to erase architecture. And what he means by that is that he wants to his architecture to show the world around you instead of just showing the architecture in itself. So the, the experience that we want to create here is that it's a, an experience of traveling through uh, and meeting things on your journey uh, that does something to you. So when you're traveling in the garden you'll meet different ways of looking at nature from Anderson's perspective. Uh, and. Um, and it, it's, when it looks like this, it's also because, you know, Anderson's universe, if you have read his fairy tales, they rarely provide any answers. When you are at the end of the story, you're kind of like, okay, now you have to ponder the meaning for yourself. When you are at the end of The Princess on the Pea, he says, now that's a true story. But it's up to you to figure out, does he mean that's a true story or that's a true story? Is it completely fact what he's just told or is it completely fiction? So what he does is that he doesn't provide you the answers. He asks you the questions. And that's the way that he has been living on in our culture because we have each, each one has had to interpret him uh, himself. And therefore this museum that we're going into in just a short bit is not a museum full of answers. It's a museum full of questions and it, it wants to to, to ask you questions about what this means to you. Uh, and that makes it a very different different museum. Is it a museum with the start and the end? Or is it more that you like try to find your own way? Uh, it is actually a little bit of both. Uh, I think I'll talk more about that when we are actually in it. Okay. Because it has both the lin linear path and uh, what you call the flaneur, the going wherever you, your heart desires. And it's, it's more for me, it's about the emancipation of the visitor, going from the linear to the free flow. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the beginning, it's a bit difficult to throw people out in the world and just navigate on your, on your own. Uh, but in the end, that is where we want to uh, end up, that people are kind of, uh, the, they are commanding, they are, they are the captain of their own ship, you know, uh, basically. So, but let's uh, just go in here and just take a little bit more of a look of the architecture. Is it correctly understood that this remains open? So this remains this, visible to the uh, people that... This, this, is, this is open. This garden that we're standing in and, and going up in, in a, just a bit is completely open, open to the public 24-7. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's also it's a museum that kind of 
it kind of blends into the city in terms of these pavilions that pop up it's clearly part of the museum but yet it's also part of an open recreational space uh, of the city I wish that we were a little bit further. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yes, it is very cool to see. And what we are standing in front of now is the sunken garden where we have just passed the street. And as you can see, they are quite big from the beginning. Uh, and, and this is, you know, you're walking in this other garden and then there's also a sunken garden as if the whole thing has just dropped down. And you will actually, it's when you are at the basement level of the experience, you'll be at at level with that sunken garden. So this is also something that is not just about, you know, architecture and nature blending together outside and inside, but also up and down is kind of blurred in this the way that they have landscaped the terrain. Uh, and this creates for what we want to try to achieve is that the fairy tale realm, the fairy tale experience is an experience of being in a place that looks like your world but it's somewhat different. It's a little bit of an in-between. And in that in-between space, if we manipulate the light and it's kind of like, where are we? We can start to ask questions about where are we? Who are we? Uh, what is this place? But the main thing is that that journey, when we ask these questions, is also that it, it remains, as in Anderson's world, a very fun journey at the same time, that is playful, uh, in its nature, something that is that museums rarely are because museums are so busy, you know, saying that we have the truth, so 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 we don't have any space for, for fun or playfulness. But Anderson has, yeah, he because he And uh, some um, some small greeneries uh, as well, and then you can travel this path between what we call the big sunken garden and the little sunken garden oh, over okay. there. So you'll be in between, kind of like weird, and almost like a bridge. Uh, so it's like almost. Is, is there an underpath here, like between the big and the little sunken garden? It's, it's like, like, like you can walk from one to the other uh, downstairs. No, downstairs you can. Yeah, downstairs you can pass. There's, there's, there's kind of like a way where you can, oh, yeah, okay. well, where there's glass so you can see it on nature on both sides. Okay. Oh, well. In a corridor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but let's, uh, of course, if there's any questions, let me hear about it. Uh, all the time you can just interrupt. Uh, but we need to go this way to get inside. So this tree over there, that has been the, this tree over there has been the, the scale for the architect 
that they wanted to have a museum that didn't overpower the nature right beside it. So, so that has kind of been the model to create something that is not too overpowering. Uh, but we need to go into this. So, yeah. Det er for, de så i september der, eller det, hvad, der kommer til at være en, uh, en særopning? Ja, det gør det. Okay. Ja. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they have, they have, this is the children's uh, play landscape, as I just talked about. It will not open on the 30th of June, this will be later. The, the main space is right next to us, which is going in. They're following me because they're going in in the midst of the exhibition, so probably up to my head, and then we'll take it out. And there it is. Hear me, would you please raise your hand? Of course, you can't do that if you can't hear 
<laughs> what he's <you're> saying. <laughs> and that is kind of like, then it continues in that manner, you know, it ends by saying, yeah, now, welcome to this show, and unfortunately we don't have any, uh, any uh, recordings of Hans Christian Anders. And the first thing here when you come in here is, hello, I'm Hans Christian Anders. Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we constantly be playing, you know, setting up a scene, and then pulling the rock underneath that scene. So what the contract we want to have with the audience is that this is the world of fairy tales. Anything can happen. Uh, nothing is as, as it seems. And the first place that you walk into is this space, this, is, which is a very theatrical space. Everything is like a collage, uh, flat, flat uh, what do you call it? Uh, like at a theater set or something like that. Uh, and then you can walk around and you can uh, experience some of the childhood areas uh, that Anderson has described from, from his childhood. And most of the time they'll be realistic. So you can walk down to, to the river and you can hear the, the women at the river saying, ah, so, it's so cold here, it's uh, so, so cold standing and washing uh, close to the river. But then every now and again everything changes. And it's this guy over there that you can see in this big showcase. Uh, it's Hans Christian Andersen that is currently frozen but moves sometime based on all archival footage that puts everything into motion. And his story is completely different because when, when you are down at the river, Hubbard. it's a, ah, Hubbard. Hubbard. always Hubbard. some nice stories to listen to. Because he Hubbard. 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 So we are playing a lot with that. There's not one story, but there is, he is creating his story. So, and the reason why we do that is because that he has created, you know, three and a, he's written three and a half autobiographies and they are vastly different because it's all about what do you want to tell at what point of time in your life. So in his first autobiography it's about, yeah, I had to fight, uh, I'm knocking on doors, won't someone help me and see me and because I'm a riddle to myself, I don't know who I am. But when he writes Fairytale of My Life in 1855, when he's at the height of his career, he says, ah, it's like a fairy tale created by God. And you know, it's really nice to have God, uh, that he is kind of the one that says that you should be on top of the mountain, because then the critics, they can just uh, shut up. Uh, so he, he, is, he is using his own storytelling to kind of control his narrative. So what we are walking through is now a world where everyone wants to tell their own narrative and they don't necessarily agree. So Anderson will try to tell his narrative, many of the literary techniques that Anderson did. So I'm quite confident that, that at least down to the age of seven, they, it will be a really fun experience. Uh, and what we have, it's kind of like, like uh, our motto is that instead of you know, doing the nostalgic version of, I've been a kid once and I'm a little bit nostalgic of not being, uh, that, that's kind of often, you know, Pixar smooths are kind of like that. <laughs> We, we are trying to say, okay, let's, let's be childish and, 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 and you know, have fun, like a, and, uh, to see it through the eyes of a child, because that's the universal about us, is that we've all been there. Uh, so, so let's... let's That's his biggest journey, so that becomes the, the thematic section of, of his travels, which is called the Bird of Passage or Trekfu in Danish. Now, the graphics, so his uh, writing would be readable, but that's actually saying Trekfu. It's very difficult to see, but he's yeah. <laughs> writing, writing uh, what you call it, a cursive uh, Gothic. So that oh. is really, not many people can actually read no. <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll go into this first section which is all about how it travels, but we don't want to tell you names and numbers. We don't think it's interesting that in 34 he was in Italy, in 40 he was in Greece. We have all been in Greece or Italy, or many of us has, and we can do it, you know, jumping in a plane, we can be there three hours later. For him it was a journey of four weeks. Uh, what, what we want to express is that you get a feeling of the sensations of travel. And he traveled, he had two modes of traveling. 
either as a retreat to the manor houses away from Copenhagen, away from, uh, from, from the bad food of the Biedermeier bourgeois, bourgeois uh, society, out to the manor houses. The food was good, he could entertain, he could, he could uh, write, he, he could be on his own. Uh, so that is recreated in these manor houses where you can actually be the voyeur, you can look in, be in control just as he is, uh, decide when and what you want to look at. Uh, and then at the outskirts, the outer parameters, every once in a while a, sh a show will run based on his travel drawings where you kind of become more and more fragmentary uh, experience of something that just runs around. So it's whenever he's traveling out in the world, it's to, you know, uh, to feel the sensations of, of what is new, you know, to be inspired. So it's just that it, new sensations is all around you and we want to create that also that it's something that for you as the visitor is all around you. So it's just a little bit of a sensation of losing yourself in the world. And in the middle here, there's his uh, travel gear and his, uh, his, all his souvenirs. And they are having a discussion about who's the most important souvenir. And uh, one of the souvenirs is a rosary that we believe was from Spain. It was in the old exhibition, we said that it was from Spain. Now we know that it's from Einsiedeln in Switzerland. Uh, so, but now it, it, it claims to be a rosary from Spain. So it says, I'm a rosary from Spain. And then the other says, no, 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 no shut up. We know that you were born in Einsiedeln, Switzerland. Come on. And everyone is just arguing that they are the most important of his souvenirs, you know, because what do you need? Sunglasses. The sun is always shining. Oh, one can always use a pair of sunglasses or something like that. So they're all, you know, infatuated with their own role in, in the narrative, except for some she seashells that he, he uh, took with him from, from uh, Skane that says that, why, why did he take us? We were just lying there minding our own business. <laughs> what, why, should, why should we be here? We had a nice time, as it was. So this kind of, again, is, is this play, uh, rather than it's just factual storytelling, you know, or, or just telling the facts of his life, it's, it's playing and trying to be like the way that he writes. But let's move on. So the ADU uh, for services literature prize will be posted here from now on? Uh, well, uh, you'll get a little plaque here, at least, <laughs> but I don't know whether it will be hosted here. Uh, but it's probably. Um, uh, they usually this. So this is the first, since we have this wall that does, that you can't see on the other side, this is the first view we have that there is another side. <laughs> You don't, you don't get a map when you come, so it's all about traveling, you know, without a map. Following, following the way, uh, discovering from, from yourself, because if you have a map, then you're all, always aligning yourself. Oh, yeah, now we're here. So, so the experience becomes a copy of the map. So, but this is the first, you see this weird tree that is growing out of one of the pillars. And as you walk around, you can also see into the central garden here, and as you walk around you here, some strange dogs from downstairs that are tempting you, asking you, you whether you want something. Wasn't that something? Wasn't it? Wasn't it? But you don't know what it is yet. And you come to this section, which is about Anderson's love life. And Anderson will say, yeah, I didn't marry because I didn't have any money. So, so but all in each of these showcases, we have one failed love relation. And the objects of those uh, love relationships, they had their own idea about why he didn't marry and why he didn't succeed. For example, we have the, uh, at one of them, we have uh, coin, the coins, coins and a purse. And they're say, uh, saying, yeah, it's true, we are very important. But he could also just have said to the girl that he actually liked her. Instead of, you know, going out to the mall and saying, say the name of the one I loved, the wind took it and carried it away. That way you, you won't marry many, many girls. So, and it's three, three women, uh, as, couple of siblings and three men, because he also had very romantic uh, feelings uh, for, for men. It was quite usual uh, at the time, so it's nothing special. Uh, the final one uh, in here will be 
is from a relationship with a guy called Hal Schaaf, who was a ballet dancer. He was 26 years younger than Anderson, and Anderson was really liking that kind of flirting that they had going on. It was so much that the rest of uh, some of his friends said, it's, you are an, an embarrassment, Anderson. So, so and, uh, and what's in here is kind of like, uh, what do you call it, uh, just the, the, the shaft of a toothbrush. And it's because uh, shaft, he said, now it's your birthday, what should I give you? And Anderson, oh, he shouldn't give me anything, just give me a, you know, a toothbrush. So it gives him one in silver with a nice inscri inscription. So it's kind of you know, the play that you have between friends, friends that don't give me anything and give them uh, nothing that is something that very special, nothing. Uh, and it's in here, and it says, when Anderson says, yeah, you couldn't even allow me that pleasure of that, uh, that young uh, ballet dancer. And the, the, the toothbrush says, yeah, but he still has me. So, so again, the objects, they feel that they are the most important thing. Is it all based on the that he wrote, or not? The, and the diaries, and the yeah, I mean, letters. And the and everything is... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, there are facts behind the... There are, there are facts <laughs> behind the story. It's yeah. not make pretend. Uh, okay. It's all uh, factual in that sense. Uh -huh. but, uh, but we want to tell it through storytelling yeah. rather than just present it as facts. This is my children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't read it. <laughs> Even. So it's, yeah, it's good that we will have a graphical uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. No, it's, okay. it's very difficult to read. Yeah, I might have a handful. When you say what it says, but I can read <laughs> <laughs> so, This is where we have all his works, all his first editions. All his manuscripts, all his paper cuts, all his drawings. We want to represent all the genres that he actually worked in. You know, drama, travel arts, autobiographies, fairy tales, novels, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are all saved in here. And we show first edition to show, show volume. Some would be surprised that he actually wrote 40 plays or something like that. Uh, and then uh, thousand poems uh, that the fairy tales actually doesn't fill that much in this uh, whole of over. Uh, but it, we also know that it can be a little bit boring to just look at manuscripts that, although they're beautiful, that you can't read. Uh, we just saw how difficult it was to read his, his, uh, his writing outside. So, so we kind of like bring things to life, and that we have the idea that the fairy tales, they want to live, you know, the, the paper cuts, they want to break free, they want to move, because they all always kind of like, uh, movement made static. Uh, the poem wants to be read aloud and stuff like that. So, so it'll come a little bit alive in here as well. Uh, but this is kind of the shrine of the place with all the all this uh, artistic production uh, in here. And if these lights won't be green. They won't be green. No, they'll be just clear lights. Okay. Smiling, <laughs> reflections. So now we have come down to the end of his, his life story. He's become a phenomenon. All of his life, he's tried to control how people see him. You know, by for instance, writing three and a half autobiographies uh, and another fairy tales about himself, basically, also. Uh, and now he's a phenomenon, and that means if you're a phenomenon, that everyone has an opinion about you. So, in a sense, he's lost himself by winning. Uh, and what we want to we want to reflect that in these showcases where you can, they're all mirror clad, and then you can look in and see in each of them is one aspect of him. So, in one is uh, that it's uh, in, in here is. Uh, it might be that he's an idol, 
for some, and we have all these locks of hair that, that they kept as mementos or autographs. In another, it's about his vanity and how people perceived him. So there are all these different aspects. And on these bus, uh, bus uh, these plinths next to, we place busts and statues of him. So this will be kind of like a fragmented mirror space. And out here, we then have, you know, how the world sees Anderson. And at that wall, which will be there, uh, in front of those showcases, we have how Anderson sees the world. Because mm -hmm. what he sees is that he sees the things that are just about to disappear that he wants to save. He can see something that could easily have disappeared, you know, being from his. He has a dream when his mother dies, he has a dream that he runs around the woods looking for a grave, and there's nowhere to be found because she's just been forgotten. Uh, history has forgotten her. And he wants to save everything that is just about to be forgotten. He wants to see, you know, um, what we overlook. So it's that there's a world in the in the water. Yeah, that the, 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 the four leaf clovers that he plucked, we have here, you know, the, the thistle of the mayweed that he plucked, the dandelion, that is all kind of parts of things that he gives a story to remember it because nobody, nobody else cares about it. So that kind of sense of, of wanting to rescue the things that are about to disappear, that is overlooked or ignored, that is at the heart of his, his kind of like look on life. And in the final showcase we have a little bouquet of heather from the moor that he plucked when he was in Jutland in 1859 and with it in his backpack or in his pocket he wrote a, a song called uh, Jutland Between Gardens and in there is, uh, there's, a, there's a verse that says come and look, come and look the heather is like a beautiful carpet, but soon there'll be a field of color. color. So he knew that agriculture was coming, it was transforming the landscape. Uh, and the way that we uh, create this experience is that you look in and you see that, that uh, bouquet of heather and you hear a, a beautiful girls choir singing the verse and then we turn down the light in the showcase so it actually disappears uh, for the visitor. So instead of telling the story of something disappearing, we want to create the experience of something disappearing. And that's how we work the whole museum through and through. It's not, everything is about the here and now. It's not about storytelling. It's not about retelling the stories. You can read them at home. It's about experiencing them anew, basically. Where so, was this fear coming from of, of Jose Anderson that he was worried that everything is about to disappear? I think he is on the edge of disappearing all the time. You know, he is, he is at, at a place in bourgeois society in Copenhagen where he has no right to be because he's from so, so uh, poor upbringing. So if you look at it, what he does with the fairy tale is he takes it from the forest and transports it into the city for, because he wants to show bourgeois society that there are other ways of seeing the world, there are other ways of being than just their own way. You know, they could be someone like him, for example. For example. So, so when he makes a story about the thistle that is on the other side of the fence, dreaming of getting into the, the garden with the, the nice flowers, and the thistle's son and daughter comes into, into a nice location because one comes in a pot and the other becomes in, in kind of like a pocket. And then the thistle says, oh, maybe it's okay not to be on the good side of the fence when just your kids are on the good side. And the sunshine that is telling the story says, that's a good notion. You should have a nice place as well. Oh, should I become in a flower pot or in a pocket? No, no, you should become in a fairy tale. You should come in a fairy tale. And here it is. So that, was, that is what Anderson does. He tries to save uh, all that is something like himself, basically, and show the world that it has meaning, that they have meaning. Uh, and I think that's a lesson for us today, not just a, a social message, but it's also a message about nature, about how we are maybe not the rulers over nature, but how we are entwined with it, and we should be more respectful for, for the nature around us. So A bit what you have done with the tree outside, that nothing is bigger than the tree kind of thing. Nothing is bigger than the tree, and maybe and that is that you know everything is integrated in you know, mm -hmm. architecture and nature. We are not the rulers of the earth, that we are not the autonomous being, that have the, the genius that writes everything ourselves, you know. We are, you know, a part of the world around us.
problem. The sunflower is cold all through. The, the words that I'm selling now, because if I was in a black box space, it would probably sound different. So this is a little bit in between, uh, in between space, and then you come into this also very small realm. The idea has really been that in the beginning you are on this very linear path down the ramp and a lot of voices around you constantly renegotiating what is true but now you're coming into this open space where it's up to you to navigate for yourself. So in here we have stage 12 of the most well known of his fairy tales but you'll probably experience them in ways that you haven't experienced them before. Uh, but this is the main area which is the area of Sambalina. Uh, and this is like a plaza, uh, and the main square of a city, and then you can go out into all the different districts of, of the city, of the town. So this is a safe space from where you can navigate out into the, the corners of, of this, this uh, realm of fairy tales. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, going from, from first a, a more traditional museum experience to now something that is about your own, uh, that you, your own experience that you encounter the, the fairy tales head on not and it's not about you know the, so much uh, the voices of objects or anything it's about uh, the experience of, of those fairy tales so over here where there's a, right now a projection area we'll have the shadow which is probably his least known of the 12 fairy tales the shadow is about a learned man that with shadow breaks free and at the end takes completely control and makes the learned man his shadow and 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 kills him off basically uh, and this experience will be that you, you just stand on a, uh, on a, there's a kind of a light spot and when you, you stand on that, your shadow appears on the wall and you can play with the shadow until the shadow does something else than what you do. Because it only seems as if it's your shadow, it's actually a projection mapping and that, why, that, that way we can make the experience of you not having control of your own shadow. So all of a sudden it does something else. So a little bit, you know, that play that this is the world that you, you are in, and you think you have control, but really you don't. So again, that's about, you know, the museum is the place of the, of, you know, middle class, bourgeois and society. And we want to play just showing that there are other views, that you're not the center of the world, I'm not the center of the world. There's other perspectives, you know, uh, if you see it from the mermaid or from the wind or from the crazy princess in Clumsy Hans or whatever. There are all these different ways of doing it. So what we want to create is this sense of wonder uh, that the world is so full and rich. Full of Recite an incident from French history using only your hands. Or list uh, your 11 favorite beverages. And it's about thinking on your feet, but it's so irrational and you can't really, there's not, not a right answer. And it's all about, you know, saying, no, not you. No good. Loser. Uh, so, so it's a game show that you can't win. Or if you win, it's kind of like, why did I win? Uh, because there's no right answers, uh, and it's about speed, you know, trying to think on your feet all the time. So this is a really this is a playful, uh, weird game show, and it's right next to, on the other side, which we'll go into next, uh, the little moment which we want to have a kind of like a deep existential experience. So it's about, you know, that the fairy tales can do all, they can be dramatic, they can be fun, they can be deep. Um, 
they are all genres mixed into one genre. Basically. This one, which one was that? Tomsi Hans. So the princess is projected on one. Yeah, and the other one you can see yourself, and you maybe you can even uh, get over to the princess in the end and you look at the one you to and say, wow. So she's asking you questions, like. Yeah, uh, well, actually, like, that's a game uh, uh -huh. show host because. So something about lip syncing uh -huh. is very difficult when we're doing different language versions. Uh -huh. So so you have a game host that is kind of like she's doing stuff and he's saying the princess wants you to blah okay. blah blah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Is all this actually in English or can it just English? English, Danish and uh, Mandarin. Basically everything? Yeah. Everything, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you can hear some beautiful, longingful uh, mermaid singing created by uh, a composer. With really beautiful music. And you can see on, on, the, on the edges, you can see drowning sailors and mermaids swimming around. So, so what we're trying, trying to do here is to create this sense of longing for that other place. Uh, whatever that might be in your world, it's not about you putting yourself in the mermaid shoes and actually using the mermaid to actually facilitate whatever you are longing for in your own life. Whether it's a kiss you only see every now and then or whatever, I don't know. But, but what we're trying to do is create feelings in people rather than, you know, and allowing something to grow inside of them rather than we're telling them how to feel or controlling the narrative too, too tightly. So it's about creating these experiences that where you are actually the centerpiece as the visitor, visitor, it's your response that is the, the real response for you. So the people will be like uh, lying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if they want, they, they, they can also look into these walls and then they can see this one is being redone because, as you see, <laughs> this should have been here. Uh, but, uh, and then you can see what actually happens to the mermaid. Up, up there. Ah, okay. so, so there's a little bit of retelling the story also going on uh, in different ways. And to come to answer this, uh, that was the kind of like a front of newspaper from the building later on that kind of tells the story through different you know, articles that it should be inside the newspaper. So you can kind of get what the story is about if you don't know it before reading that. You can see what the story of the moment is about by looking into these. So we are doing a little bit of retelling, uh, even though that, that it's not about just uh, re-experiencing the story. It is about that central experience. Uh, this is because uh, the wireframe is kind of like a take on his, his uh, line when, when he's, he's drawing. Uh, but uh, so, so that is how we want to represent nature. We could easily have done something that was very kind of like, let's say, plastic fantastic, very beautiful, very much like mimetic that wanted to be closer to, to what it looks like in real life. I think the nature of the character, the nature of literature is that it is full of gaps that you have to uh, fill out in your own mind. And that's where some of the fantasy comes from, comes from yourself. So if we made it too powerful and too perfect, then there was no place for your interpretation. And it's also the same how we represent, for example, mermaids, because every culture has their own take on it. So, so we, we could easily kill it too much, so we want to make something that is kind of like a little bit open to interpretation and not, not be saying that this is how it should look. We okay. want to leave gaps for the imagination. And the mermaids would be like in projections? They would be in projections, uh -huh. yeah, but it would kind of be blurred through water and very dark. And, uh, and they will be like speaking or uh, among them or how... I you'll the just hear here? them speak, okay. but it will not be connected to the visuals. Uh -huh. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, 
Yeah. So this is a look at the in-between in space, and then you come into this concept barrier of the So the idea has really been that in the beginning you are on this very linear path down the ramp and a lot of voices around you constantly renegotiating what is true. But now you're coming into this open space where it's up to you to navigate for yourself. So in here we have stage 12 of the most well-known of his fairy tales, but you'll probably experience them in ways that you haven't experienced them before. Uh, but this is the main area, which is the area of Zambalina. Uh, and this is like a plaza, uh, and the main square of a city. And then you can go out into all the different districts of, of the city, of the town. So this is a safe space from where you can navigate out into the, the corners of, of this, this uh, realm of fairy tales. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, going from, from first a, a more traditional museum experience to now something that is about your own, uh, that you your own experience that you encounter the, the fairy tales uh, head on, not and it's not about you know the, so much uh, the voices of objects or anything. It's about uh, the experience of, of those fairy tales. So over here, where there's uh, right now a projection area, we'll have the shadow, which is probably his least known of the twelve fairy tales. The shadow is about a learned man that with shadow breaks free and uh, at the end takes completely control and makes the learned man his shadow. And, and, and kills him off, basically. Uh, and this experience will be that you, you just stand on a, on a, there's a kind of a light spot, and when you, you stand on that, your shadow appears on the wall, and you can play with the shadow until the shadow does something else than what you do. Because it only seems as if it's your shadow. It's actually a projection mapping, and that, why, that, that way we can make the experience of you not having control of your own shadow. So all of a sudden, it does something else. So a little bit, you know, that play that this is the world you, you are in, and you think you have control, but really you don't. So again, that's about, you know, the museum is the place of the, of, you know, middle class, bourgeois, and society. And we want to play just showing that there are other views, that you're not the center of the world, I'm not the center of the world. There's other perspectives, you know, uh, if you see it from the mermaid, or from the wind, or from the crazy princess in clumsy hands or whatever. There are all these different ways of doing it. So what we want to do is this sense of wonder, uh, that the world is so full and rich, full of Recite an incident from French history using only your hands. Or list uh, your 11 favorite beverages. And it's about thinking on your feet, but it's so irrational and you can't really, there's not, not a right answer. And it's all about, you know, saying, no, not you. No good. Loser. Uh, so, so it's a game show that you can't win. Or if you win, it's kind of like, why did I win? Uh, because there's no right answers, uh, and it's about speed, you know, trying to think on your feet all the time. So this is a really this is a playful, uh, weird game show, and it's right next to, on the other side, which we'll go into next, uh, the little moment which we want to have a kind of like a deep existential experience. So it's about, you know, that the fairy tales can do all, they can be dramatic, they can be fun, they can be deep. Um, they are all genres mixed into one genre, basically. This one, which one was that? Tomsi Hans. So it's 
So the princess is projected on one? Yeah, and the other one you can see yourself and you maybe you can even uh, get the forward to the princess in the end and you look at the one you to and say, ah. So she's asking you questions like... Yeah, well actually that's a game uh, uh -huh. show host because this is something about lip syncing. Uh -huh. It's very difficult when we're doing different language versions. Uh -huh. So so you have a game host that is kind of like she's doing stuff and he's saying the princess wants you to blah okay. blah blah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Is all this actually in English or can it just English, English, English and Mandarin? Basically everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you can hear some beautiful, longing for a mermaid singing, created by a composer. Of really beautiful music. And you can see on, on the on the edges, you can see drowning sailors and mermaids swimming around. So, so what we are trying trying to do here is to create this sense of longing for that other place, uh, whatever that might be in your world. It's not about you know, putting yourself in the mermaid scene, it's actually using the mermaid to actually facilitate whatever you are longing for in your own life. Whether it's a kiss you only see every now and then or whatever, I don't know. But, but what we're trying to do is create feelings in people rather than, you know, and allowing something to grow inside of them rather than we're telling them how to feel or controlling the narrative too, too tightly. So it's about creating these experiences that where you are actually the centerpiece as the visitor, visitor, it's your response that is the, the real response for you. So the people will be like uh, lying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If they want, they can, they, can also, they can also look into these walls and then they can see this one is being redone because as you can see, this should have been here. Uh, but, uh, and then you can see what actually happens to the mermaid. Up, up. Yeah. Ah, okay. so, so there's a little bit of retelling the story also going on uh, in different ways. And it comes to answer this, uh, that was the kind of like a front of newspaper from the political background that kind of tells the story through different you know, articles that it should be inside the newspaper. So you can kind of get what the story is about if you don't know it before reading that. You can see what the story of the mermaid is about by looking into these. So we are doing a little bit of retelling. Uh, even though that, that it's not about just uh, re-experiencing the story, it is about that central experience. Uh, this is because uh, the wireframe is kind of like a take on his, his uh, line when, when he's, he's drawing. Uh, but uh, so, so that is how we want to represent nature. We could easily have done something that was very, kind of like, let's say, plastic fantastic, very beautiful, very much like mimetic that wanted to be closer to, to what it looks like in real life. I think the nature of the fairy tale, the nature of literature, is that it is full of gaps that you have to uh, fill out in your own mind. And that's where some of the fantasy comes from, comes from yourself. So if we made it too powerful and too perfect, then there was no place for your interpretation. And it's also the same how we represent, for example, mermaids, because every culture has their own take on it. So, so we, we could easily kill it too much, so we want to make something that is kind of like a little bit open to interpretation and not, not be saying like, this is how it should look. We okay. want to leave gaps for the imagination. And the mermaids would be like in projections. They would be in projections, uh -huh. yeah, but it would kind of be blurred through water and very dark. And, uh, and they will be like speaking or uh, among them or how... I you'll just hear them speak, okay. but it, it will not be connected to the visuals. Uh -huh. Okay, so. this is the voice series. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Up and oh, look lovely. Then, yeah, dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.